been looking at this morning, so. <laughs> it was good. That was good. Thank you for that. Um, let's turn back to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 1. And uh, we've been going through here. We'll just we'll read our, re, reread our text briefly to establish in our minds again uh, our topic from this morning, the, the three requests that Paul had for specifically for the church there in Ephesus. As he began to pray for them, I cease not to give thanks for you and make mention of you in my prayers, he says in verse 16. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. So here's what He's desiring as He prays for their wisdom and then their knowledge of God and their understanding of Him. He wants them to grow in a fuller, uh, uh, to, to understand the fuller depth of these three things, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. We looked at those two this morning. And then finally this afternoon, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all, things is added, that's fine, but it's just all, it's everything, all under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all uh, things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all." Uh, so uh, uh, understand the hope of his, that you may know the hope of his calling, number one. Number two, what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints? And then number three, this afternoon, that you might know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Paul desired that they would know that. It says in our text that that is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Right? I'm going to get louder. I saw Brother Gary just do that. I'm going to get louder because you guys ate more dessert than I did. All right. I held back because I told the men earlier, I said, what? How embarrassing would that be if I fell asleep in the pulpit? Right. So uh, but uh, some of you guys had two or three plates, maybe. So I'm going to be trying to help you out. All right. Um, so the exceeding greatness of his power, that is the mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Right. Uh, uh, um, Ecclesiastes, he says, it's better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a party. Why? Because that is the end of all men, and men will lay it to heart. Not the end with God, right? That's the, we know the finality of death. I've never seen anybody get up out of the casket. But it's possible with God, right? And these bodies are going to die, and they're going to perish, and they're going to be laid in the grave. Uh, even if we're still alive when Christ comes back, these bodies aren't going to make it, right? They are going to perish. But I have a hope beyond the grave. And so the power of God that raised Christ from the dead, that same power is in you, church, and that power is for you. Think about that. That power that raised Christ from the dead, that made sure that uh, you know, all that would be accomplished in the salvation of His church as Christ came in and He's fulfilled His passion and accomplished all that. And we see the mighty power of God revealed in that. That power is working for you. That's amazing. It is in you and it is for you, uh, it, 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 which He wrought in Christ, it says in verse 20, when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand, He's got all power. He's been above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the mightiest, the greatest of all powers. You could have a bunch of atomic bombs uh, uh, lined up side by side and it wouldn't equal this power here. God's above it all, right? No power that man can display can match this great power. And yet this is what I want you to know, the exceeding greatness of His power to usward, who believe. That power is directed towards you, church, according to the working of His mighty power. And listen to verse 22. And He's put all things under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all things. Do not, do not, don't lose the blessing in these last three, word, three words. To the church. 
That's what Paul says I want you to know. I want you to understand that the power of God is for you. It is directed to you. God is going to accomplish these things in your life. And this great, uh, this place of exaltation that Jesus Christ has been given with everything being put under the church, uh, He's the head over all things to the church, he says in verse 22. And look how fully you have been connected to him in verse 23. You are church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You know, it's a cheesy statement uh, because we've heard it so many times from that movie. I've never seen the movie. I think it was Jerry Maguire, but where he makes the comment uh, to, I think it's to a woman, you complete me. But that's exactly what you do, church. According to God, right? You are the fullness of His body, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. God says, I wouldn't be complete without you. I have connected you to me. I, the, the picture of Christ in His church is one of the head and the body. And if you lose either part of that, you had, you're not really dealing with an individual anymore, right? Both parts die. If it's, I'm, I'm glad y'all aren't sitting on the front of your row because this is the splash zone right here, all right? <laughs> but both parts would die if it was separated from one another. We've got vital organs in both parts of the body there. God said, I would have to die for you to be disconnected from me, church. That's how much I've attached myself to you, that I've joined myself unto you. That oneness that Christ is praying for with us and one with Him in John 17. That's what God is accomplishing in His church. Nothing is outside of His dominion and power. We are fully connected to Him. Verse 23 says, these things are in you. These things are for you. And so as we know, again, Romans 8, uh, Romans 8, like I said, is a great companion text to this text here. Romans 8 asks the question, if God is for us, who can be against us? What's got you so worried and anxious, right? What's got me so downcast? Why would I be struggling? Why would I be, uh, why would I be in despair if this God is for us? I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Who, what can be against us if God is for us? We're living at a time in this nation which, which really, you know, for the first time in this nation, it looks like things are, you know, the laws are starting to change and are starting to, uh, we're, we're reaching that point to where it's like, I could in the very near future be thrown in jail for saying the truth of God's Word. I mean, that's where we are in this nation now. And yet, if God is for us, who can be against us? Sister Christine and I were talking about fear and how debilitating fear is. Fear doesn't have any place in the heart of the believer, except for the fear of God. And if that God is for us, why would we fear anybody? Why should I be afraid, right? Right? Whom shall I fear? Thou art with me. Second Chronicles 16.9, we're familiar with this verse. It says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. For what purpose and to what end? To show Himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward Him. Huh? Right? Think about that. God's going back and forth. God's gazing over the whole earth. For what purpose? To show Himself mighty for His church. To show Himself powerful for you, church. This is what Paul is praying for. This is what I want you to know. I want you to understand His power is directed for you. God's awesome and mighty power is for your good. All of His power directed toward us, ensuring that Romans 8.28 is true. All things work together for the good of them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. It's because God is all-powerful that we can trust in that statement, right? That we can believe that is so. Because God in His great power is ensuring that that is so. Romans 8.28 is true. 
because of that. The impossibility that's set forth in Matthew 24, 24 is true because of that. You guys remember that? False Christ will arise. False prophets show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. But it's an impossibility. Why? Because this power is for you. Because He that began a good work in you is going to make sure that He gets you all the way to the finish line. That's the power that I want you to know, Paul prays. That's what I want you to understand the depths of. Uh, the things impossible with men are possible with God. And He is ready. He is, his eyes are going to and fro in the earth looking at every moment for that op opportunity. Not even just that opportunity because God's not looking for opportunity. He's directing all these things. He's ready at every moment to manifest His great power to bring to pass every promise that He's made to His precious bride. All the promises of, of God in Jesus Christ for you, church, are yea and amen. You get it, right? There, there's no second-class citizens. Uh, you know, he's going to labor about that later in Ephesians 2. We won't look at that. But uh, you know, between the Jews and the Greeks, the Jews and the Gentiles, you get it. You're all sons. If you get in through Jesus Christ, you get it all. The inheritance is all. There's no second-class citizens, as Brother Gene says all the time. Amen. The promises of God belong to His people, belong to His church. And in His mighty power, He has seen that they, all of those things will come to pass. We are the apple of His eye. We are never left nor forsaken. And so I love the way Philippians 1.6 reads here. I want to read this. Philippians 1.6. Y'all need to turn a little bit anyway. I can see. I can see some of the eyes. Even yeah, I'm being loud, but still. Oh, oh, it's working on me. That chocolate cake is working. I didn't get any chocolate cake, huh? You deserve it because you didn't save me a piece of chocolate cake. <laughs> Sorry, that was mean. Uh, Philippians 1.6. Listen to this. Being confident. What did we say hope meant this morning? It's a confidence, right? Uh, uh, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It, I like the way it begins. We're confident in that. Why? Because it is, it is the mighty God that is making sure that it's so. It is His power that is ensuring that this will be. Church, you understand that Jesus singled you out, right? You recognize that He prayed for you when He did not pray for others. Read John 17. I pray not for the world. There were souls He did not pray for. But I pray for those that have believed on my name. I pray for these, these disciples that are here with me. Now, Jesus singled you out, church. He refused to pray for others. Let, let me, I want you to see it, just in case. I think you all know it, but let's, let's read it just in case. I want you to see how special you are. I want you to see the power of God working for you. I pray for them, verse number 9. Who are we talking about? Those that they, they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, verse 9. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And I always like to read verse 20 whenever I read verse 9, because I want you to understand, church, that includes you right here in 2017. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's us. That's you. That's God interceding on your behalf. Like He did for Peter when He says, Peter, Satan's desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But what? I've prayed for you. And not if you are converted, but when you are converted, Peter. Because I pray for you, right? Then strengthen your brethren. He didn't say if, maybe. When you are. Because I interceded for you. Because I went to the Father on your behalf. And you know what? He's pleased with me. I'm His beloved Son in whom He is well pleased. He never said He did that for Judas. All He said concerning Judas is, I chose twelve of you and one of them is a devil. One of you is a devil. He interceded on Peter's behalf. 
He has prayed for you, church. I prayed for thee. What did Nebuchadnezzar say about this great God? Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel 4 in verse 35. Daniel 4, 35. You remember Nebuchadnezzar having to have his sense taken from him? God in His mercy did that. Could have put him down and left him in that state. But God in His mercy put him there and brought him back. After Nebuchadnezzar had looked at his kingdom and said, Look at this great kingdom I have built. And God taught him a lesson. I bet you he never said that again. He, when, he can't, when his senses come to him, he understood what a fool he had been. I lifted up my eyes at the end of those days, verse 34. Lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored Him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Man got together at Babel, said we're going to build this great tower, and we're going to make a name for ourselves. And God said, that's what you think. Doesn't matter how many we get together, right? Doesn't matter how great the force is against God. All the inhabitants of the earth, are, all of them, are reputed as nothing before Him. We've seen that in our Esther study of, as we've gone through that on Sunday morning. It didn't matter that the, that the man that was basically running the kingdom for the king was against the Jews and determined to kill them all on this one day. He's not greater than God. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? This is God, the exceeding greatness of his power. And Paul says, I want you to know that it is toward us who believe. That power is directed towards you. That power is for you. That power is making sure that you're among those that endureth. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Guys, there aren't any accidents. That's not the God that's declared in the Scripture. He's accomplishing His will. It shall come to pass. He manifested His great power in that He raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And then He says that same power is for you. That same power is working in you. This God is for us. And Paul wanted, he said, I want you guys to be overwhelmed by that thought. You ever felt empowered? You ever felt like, man, I can really, I can do this. I, I got the strength. I got the, I got the backing. You know, I got the investors to accomplish. You ever felt empowered? Not like this. This is the only sure thing. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It will come to pass. Man makes his plans, and God says, "You better say, Lord willing." Because we don't have the power to bring it to pass. But God is for you, church. He is not against you. And He is ensuring that everything is... Those things that we talked about this morning, the hope of His calling, the, the, the resurrection that we're looking forward to, the inher eternal inheritance that above all includes Himself that we're looking forward to, God's great and mighty power is ensuring that that will come to pass. Paul said, I want you to be overwhelmed in this. My desire is that you would be full of wisdom and understanding concerning this. He prayed earnestly that they would embrace it and understand it and know it. And that's what I want you to know, church. That's what I want to know. Is I, could you imagine? Can you imagine the state of worship that we would be in all the time if we walked in the reality of this? If we could sense the reality of that all the time? 
Not about how great we are, but about how great our God is. And that He is for me. That He knows me by name. It's significant that we, when we read about the rich man, that we don't know his name, but we know Lazarus. Because God knows his name. I know my sheep. And I call them by name. You, you're on a first name basis with God. You realize that? Man, constant state of worship if we lived in the fullness and in the consciousness of these glorious truths. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. And Paul, Paul pleaded with God concerning the churches of Ephesus. Lord, calls them to know that. Lord, calls Grace Baptist Church to know that. This is not just one small little thing, you know, something we got to check off our list in our week. We gather together and God meets with us here. And He prepares our hearts for that which will transpire in the coming weeks. And He gives us that food that's going to sustain us for many days. God speaks to us. He's interested in your good, children, and only your good. The, the chastisement it talks about, is, is it Hebrews 12? I think it is. Or is it 11? I, never, I get those confused. But that's what he says. He says he only does it for our good. He's got your best interest at heart always. And he's working everything together for your good. That's a blessing. I pray that that would encourage your hearts in your daily walk to understand that God would grant us a fuller understanding of those truths and that we would rest in that, that we would quit being distracted by the things that are here, that we would quit being overwhelmed by the things in the here and now, and that we would fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ and we would understand what we have in Him. And that we wouldn't get bogged down in this stuff. But that we would be able to rise. He seated us in heavenly places. Wings of an eagle, right? To rise up above these things. Have done with lesser things. And understand what we have in Jesus Christ. Now I told you this morning, you've just heard a portion of it. And there are many churches that would stop right there. And they would just take Ephesians 1 and be done. But that's not where God stopped. And the Lord said it was very important. Remember, the chapter divisions have been added later. And there's an and at the beginning of chapter 2 in Ephesians. And so what does that tell us? Well, He's adding on to what He previously said. This goes together. This is connected, right? And so, having seen the abundant blessings that belong to us, and I want us to walk in the fullness of those things, and it will, it will change. We will worship God daily, constantly, if we're aware of those things. Having seen these abundant blessings, though, at the end of chapter 1, we need to be reminded that there is no room for boasting, and so the beginning of chapter 2 will help with that. I don't want any of us to be Pharisees, right? And the Pharisees, they took the promises of God for themselves, and what did they do? They said... Man, I'm sure glad I'm not like that next guy. Hey, God prayed for me in John 7. Did pray for that guy over there, you know. And Self-righteousness sets in. Lest we think that way, lest we become prideful and boastful and think too much of ourselves, God puts right on the heels of these glorious blessings some other glorious truths that put us in our place and remind us what we are and what we were without Him. There is no room for boasting, and there is no right to claim that we somehow earned this glorious status that we read about at the end of chapter number 1. And so he begins chapter 2 this way, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who can tell me who that is? Satan. Satan. You realize you were Satan followers before, Right? Don't try to pretty it up and make it be anything other than what it was. You followed Satan. We, you know, we see the upside down pentagram and we slap that on something and that's Satan worshipers. That was, a, that was a spooky thing when I was in high school. I remember doing a presentation on that. You know, We were all Satan worshipers outside of Jesus Christ. You were led about by the prince of the power 
of the air. In time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also, and by the way, what's the next pronoun? We. we. I want you to see that because Paul includes himself in that. I don't want you to get confused about the things that follow where he's, he's comparing the, the Jew and the Gentile and think that somehow you know the Jews weren't in on this. Paul said, I was just like it. We, all of us, we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, just like everybody else. Just like everybody else. Even as others. Now this right here is what's going to keep our pride in check whenever we read the end of Ephesians 1. Don't want you to lose that. I want you to fully embrace that. I want you to walk in the knowledge of that, but I don't want you to ever forget that alongside verses 1 and 3 in chapter 2. In fact, let me tell you something. If you can fully embrace verses 1 through 3 in chapter 2, it'll make the end of chapter 1 even more glorious. Because wow! This was me before God got a hold of me. And all that stuff explain, describes me in chapter 1? How could that be? It's like seeing the wisdom of God in the fall of man in the garden. God could have told us He was merciful and gracious, but would we have ever been able to grasp what a glorious expression of the love of God that was toward us if we hadn't been dead in trespasses and sins? So to have the hope of His calling, to have this eternal inheritance, to understand that God's power is for me for my good, those, those things are even greater reason for rejoicing when I recognize that I was following Satan before God got a hold of me. That I wasn't this pretty good looking thing, but like Brother Gene said, we were dead in trespasses and sins and all I could do was stink. That's all a dead man can do. I could only stink in the nostrils of a holy God. If I'm righteous right now, I clearly wasn't when the Lord found me. If I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to me, I wasn't when the Lord found me. And I was no different than the worst criminal. None. Think about it. Get it in your head now. What is it that you think is so disgusting and so vile and so abominable? You were just as bad. I was just as bad. That's why Paul called himself the what of sinners? The chief. He said, I'm worst on my list. Well, wait a minute, Paul. I mean, we got, we got murderers and rapists and adulterers and liars and, you know, we got all these different sin. I'm the chief of sinners, he said. Do you understand that about yourself? Do you view yourself to be just as guilty? We were just like every fallen human being. We read the phrase this morning, having no hope and without God in the world. And this problem that the Pharisees had with self-righteousness, they couldn't serve the souls of others. They made others twofold the child of hell instead of helping them with their burden. They looked down their noses. They couldn't associate with publicans and harlots and Samaritans and Gentiles. But if they'd understood and owned verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians chapter 2, they would have been able to serve absolutely anyone. And if we as a church are going to be able to serve the souls that are around us in a day of abounding iniquity, we have to own Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 for ourselves. And we have to embrace the truths at the end of Ephesians 1, knowing that Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 are true for us as well. Some people describe mankind as being basically good. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody. Brother Gary, there is none good but God. If God's not in you, you don't have any goodness in you. We had a disobedient nature, it says. Did you see that word? I, I want to just consider that word 
just a little bit before we wrap up this afternoon. Uh, we were among, uh, uh, among whom also we all, Paul said this was me too, had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. We weren't following God. We were following the lust of our flesh. We were fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. I was focused on me, not on God. And we were by nature the children of wrath even as others. We, we had a disobedient nature that followed the lust of our sinful flesh and had no desire to obey a holy God. This is the boat that every lost man is in. This is the boat that we were in prior to salvation. Let me show you this word nature in Romans 1. Romans 1. And I wanted to read it here. Because I said, think about sins that are, that are uh, awful and abominable to you. And in the context in which this is using this verse here, I want you to understand that you had a wicked, sinful, lustful nature before God saved you. It talks about them changing the truth of God in verse 22, 25 into a lie and worshiped and served the Creator more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections and even their women did change the natural use into that which is against, and here it is again, nature. Did that which was unnatural. This wasn't, I mean, even the, the, the instinctive things that's just there because I'm a human being, they left those natural Things and men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one towards another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. We had a wicked and a vile nature. That was your nature, he said. We were by nature the children of wrath, just like everybody else, even as others. It's, a, it's translated differently in James 3, 7. Look at it there. James 3, 7. And this will help us understand what it means. You were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. It is the word kind in James 3, 7. For every, in fact, my margin says in the Greek, this is the word nature. For every nature, every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of animals, right? We understand that. We understand that there's foxes and bears and squirrels and, you know, or tree rats as we like to call them or whatever else. There's all these different animals and they've all got their own nature, right? They're all different kinds. I was trying to remember the example that Brother Gene uses and I hope I got it right because he's going to be upset with me if I don't. But the bee, it's his nature to go to the flower, right? Just as much as it's the nature for the fly to go to the cow patty, Right? It's just what they do. You don't see the bees over there. You don't see the flies over there because their nature directs them to do one or the other. It's their nature to do that. Well, guess what our nature was? To run hard after sin just like everybody. We were children by nature. Children of wrath. Let that sink in. The wrath of God was upon us. It's not that we had this E stamped on us, you know, for elect, and you know, God somehow kind of overlooked that with us. You were just as bad as everybody else. That's important for us to understand. Because, see, the Pharisees thought, well, we've always been a little bit special, right? Because we came from Abraham. So even when I entered into the world, I was a child of Abraham, and, you know, I just kind of led a charmed life. But as far as God was concerned, I was just a little bit better. That's not how God describes things with his elect. He said you were just as bad as they were. You were children of, you were just as much following the devil as they did. You were children of wrath even as others. That was your nature. No different. Listen, we were a different creature then. We were a different creation then. Isn't that the word used in 2 Corinthians 5.17? He's made us a new what? 
creature, which we know is the word? Creation, right? You are a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away because God, He didn't just clean you up, church, right? You didn't just need a good bath because you were a little muddy. You needed a new nature. You needed to be made a new creation. God had to totally remake you. You weren't born with little parts inside that were loving and seeking God. You despised obedience to Him and you served yourself. Maybe you looked a little better on the outside. I mean, I was a good church boy. You know, I was raised in church and man, God must be really pleased with me because I don't talk like those other kids do and I don't do those other things that kids do and God had to show me you're just as vile and as bad as they are. And listen, Christian, if you've never come to that place of repentance and, and admitted and confessed what you are, confessed your sins and admitted how bad you were and recognized you were just as bad as everybody else and you were going straight to hell and needed God's mercy like everybody else did, you need to get saved. <coughs> because this path starts with repentance. That means confessing what you were. That's the experience in the public and God have mercy on me, a sinner. So He had to make us a new creation, not just clean us up. Look at how Galatians 6.15 puts it. Galatians 6.15. We are nearly done, so if you can resist that cake just a little bit longer... We're going to make it. We're going to make it. Bob, Bobby, will you pick me up if I go through the pews? I'm joking. I wouldn't do that to y'all. <laughs> Galatians 6.15 For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but what do you need? A new creation. You need to be made a whole new creature. You need a new nature. Just like God spoke the world into existence, you need Him to speak spiritual life in existence in you. You've got to be born again. Because you're old, your first birth only leads to death. God's got to remake you. You don't need to be circumcised or uncircumcised. There's not any work that you can bring. You need God to make you a new creation. We were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Brother Gary read it this morning in Matthew 3, 9. He said, you're boasting about being Abraham's seed. God could raise up from these stones children to Abraham. I mean, He made man from dust, right? God could take the stones... And bring a whole another race forward if he wanted to. Moses, step back, let me destroy them, and you know what? I'll bring a whole mighty nation from you. I can do it if I want to. He spoke the world into existence in six days. I think he's able. And he can remake you. He can speak life into your soul. He can give you a new nature. You're running and striving and thinking, and I can't do enough. You won't ever do enough. You need God to give you a new nature. You need to just give up and confess, I can't do it, and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Give me a new heart that wants to. You need that. It's got to, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 have to happen first, and then the, the, 10, the works in verse 10 will come as a result of that. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. You can't attain that. That's what we were talking about this money, the, the, this morning, all the money in the lottery won't purchase that for you. It's a gift of God. It's not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 says, then if he's done that, he's also ordained that it, you be in his workmanship, he's also ordained that the good works flow out of that. And it'll come, but in that order. So there is no room for boasting. And let's, 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 uh, let's go to Romans 11 and we'll, we'll kind of wrap up our thoughts here. Romans 11. Galatians 6.15 says you've got to be made a new creation. You've got to be made a new creature. And so what this will work in our hearts as we understand these glorious truths 
in Ephesians 1 and we walk in the fullness of these things, this will make sure that we never fall prey to what they're being warned against in Romans uh, 11 here. Verse number 17 says, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fat and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches... Don't you get proud about that. Don't you start boasting, thinking that you're something. Don't forget Ephesians 1 through 3, where you came from. Boast not against the branches. If you're a boaster against the branches, guess what you're doing? You're bearing the root instead of the root bearing thee. And that's not how it works. The branches are supplied and flow from out of the root, not the other way around. If thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then... Well, he says, if you boast, let me remind you, it's the root that bears thee and not the other way around. Thou wilt say, then the branches were broken off that I might be graft in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity... But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. There's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing that he can't do. Nothing is too hard for thee, Jeremiah said. With men these things are impossible, but with God all things are are possible. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by what? Nature. nature. Didn't you have a different nature? And didn't God get you in on this thing? Can He do that for them? Man, do you see the hope that that gives us as we declare the gospel of Jesus Christ for every single soul that we encounter? I can't ever be like a Pharisee that looks at this one and says he can't get in. <laughs> Everybody I look at is like, well, man, I was so bad. God got me in. He can get that person in too. You were wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. How much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So there is no room for boasting. We were under the wrath of God just like everyone outside of Jesus Christ. And I want to close with the two words in, in Ephesians 2. I love, well, we'll just read all of verse 4, but I love those first two words. When you get and you hear how bad it is. I mean, you see the wisdom of God in this. It's like, man, this is a real downer, you know, after considering the end of Ephesians 1. And now you're going to tell us this in Ephesians 2, God? But it's not a downer when you understand this is what you were. And then Ephesians 4 says, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us. All this does for us is it causes us to understand the depth of God's love toward us. And it causes the Christian to rejoice even more. And says, God, I didn't do anything to deserve this. I, 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 there was nothing attractive in me when you looked at me. It was just grace alone. It was just God in His infinite mercy that saved my poor soul and made it so that all of those things, the, the, uh, uh, the hope of His calling, the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe, those things are mine because but God. But God did that. He loved the unlovable, when, as the hymn says, He saved a wretch like me. He saved us by His grace. And so as it should be, our gracious God gets all the glory for our salvation. And we can minister to the souls that are around us. And it doesn't matter how bad they look. We know that God is able because God saved us. Because He saved me when I had nothing to offer Him when I had nothing to bring to Him. All I could present before Him was my sin. In return, He gave me His righteousness. And so, my heart's going to keep singing hallelujah. What a Savior.